In this video, we'll be talking about an important liquidity focused ratio and this is the LCR, liquidity coverage ratio. The LCR, liquidity coverage ratio, it was introduced by the Basel Committee as part of its Basel III reforms. The aim of introducing this ratio was to enhance the tools or let's say the metrics which supervisors have access to for the purpose of assessing the short term resilience of the liquidity cushions maintained by banks. To understand what this means, let's head over to the definition of the LCR. The liquidity coverage ratio, LCR, simply put, is the ratio of a bank's high quality liquid assets, HQLA, to the net expected cash outflows during a 30 day period of significant liquidity related stress. Okay, what's so special about a 30 day period? Well, 30 days is believed to be the minimum time that a bank or let's say even its supervisors would need to take any kind of corrective action if something were to go wrong. Okay, For a bank to be compliant with respect to LCR, it has to ensure that at all times the value of its LCR is greater than or equal to this minimum stipulated value of 100%. What this means is that for a bank which is compliant with respect to LCR, if suddenly a stressful scenario were to emerge, then this bank would have an asset buffer or you can call it a liquidity cushion which is big enough for it to be able to still entertain its net expected cash outflows for this upcoming month of stress when its other risky funding sources would have dried up or vanished. Okay, this is what is meant by assessing the short term resilience of a bank's liquidity cushions. Okay, now to understand how the LCR works, let's dig deeper into a few specifics regarding its calculation. The first thing which you have to understand is that both the numerator as well as the denominator of the LCR, both of these, these are tied to the stressful scenario that we talked about. Okay, this scenario is a rather acute one. In this scenario, we have to simulate significant stress, specifically from a liquidity standpoint. And in this scenario, we are focusing not only on institution specific factors, but also on shocks which are system wide in nature. Okay, systemic shocks. The specifics of this scenario, these are basically provided by the supervisor and the specifics, they are very closely linked to the actual circumstances that prevailed during the 2008 global financial crisis. A few such specifics have been listed here. In this scenario, we are assuming that our bank undergoes a ratings downgrade by three notches or more. This downgrade is significant enough to even trigger collateral posting requirements, requirements which may be non-existing at the moment. In this scenario, we are talking about a withdrawal of retail deposits, which in normal times are considered to be very stable or let's say sticky. In this scenario, we are talking about partial loss of both unsecured wholesale funding capacity as well as secured short term funding capacity, which comes from certain types of collateral and from certain counterparties. Okay. In this scenario, we are talking about a marked increase in volatility, which drives up margin slash collateral requirements. It happens both on account of increase in potential future exposure for derivatives transactions and also the revision upwards of the haircut which has been assigned to securities which are used for the purpose of collateral. Okay, Then 
In this scenario, we are talking about a drawdown on credit lines, which the bank has extended to its preferred customers. And also, we are talking about the need to actually repurchase debt, which has been issued by special purpose vehicles, SPVs, and SIVs, special investment vehicles of our bank. And this repurchasing of debt, it happens for the purpose of safeguarding the bank's reputation. Okay, connect this with reputation risk. This is how this scenario looks like. Now, let's talk about the numerator for our LCR, the HQLA. Think of the HQLA, you know, the, the liquidity cushion or the asset buffer to basically contain those assets which can be converted immediately to cash with no loss of value or maybe a negligible loss of value. Now, these assets, which can be deemed as high-quality liquid assets, they have a few fundamental characteristics. Number one, these assets are inherently low-risk in nature. Number two, these assets have an ease and certainty around their valuation. Number three, these assets, they trade on big and developed exchanges. And number four, these assets have a low correlation with other risky assets. Okay? Now, one has to understand this, that all assets which can get included in this HQLA, they are not of the same quality. Okay? Assets, even though they are deemed as high quality, they do differ in terms of their capability to generate liquidity or funding in a stressed kind of environment. Therefore, assets which get included in HQLA, they are categorized into these categories, okay, depending on their grade or quality. Broadly speaking, we are talking about two categories here, level one and level two. Level one assets, they are truly speaking high quality liquid assets. This category will include assets such as cash and bank notes. This would include central bank reserves and also in this category we will include marketable securities which are issued by or backed by the central bank. Okay, Then the assets which go in this category level 1, please remember these assets are assigned a haircut of 0%. Okay, Then Assets which go in the level 2 category, these assets are assigned a non-zero haircut. Level 2 assets, these are further subdivided into two categories, level 2A and level 2B. In level 2A category, we would include assets such as government securities, then highly rated corporate bonds, I mean bonds which have a rating of double A minus or higher, in this category, you would also include covered bonds. The haircut for this category is 15%. Okay, coming on to level 2B, in this category, you would include plain vanilla corporate debt, which is rated triple B minus or higher. You would include residential mortgage-backed securities. And in this category, you would also include equities. The haircuts for this category go from 25% all the way to 50%. Okay? Now, the Basel Committee, it wants to ensure that this guy, HQLA, is as well diversified as possible. There is no concentration with respect to any given type of asset. And therefore, what we have in place are capping rules with respect to level 2, and level 2B. Your level 2 assets, they can be at most 40% of your HQLA. Your level 2B assets, they can be at most 15% of your HQLA. Okay? Now let's come to the denominator. In the denominator, we have net expected cash outflows. This number in the denominator is calculated as the difference between the expected cash outflows during our 30-day stressed period and the expected cash inflows during this 30-day stressed period. To keep things conservative, 
this number is capped at 75% of this number. That means your expected cash inflows can be at most 75% of your expected cash outflows. What this then implies is that your net expected cash outflows will be at least 25% of this number. Okay. Now, to estimate your expected cash outflows, what you have to do is that you have to go through the currently outstanding balances of all your liabilities and your off-balance sheet commitments and you have to multiply each of these numbers by an associated runoff rate which is provided by the supervisor. Okay, basically, if I were to connect things back to the specifics of this scenario that we talked about, we had said that in this stressful scenario, we will have, for example, withdrawal of our retail deposits. Okay, and this withdrawal basically constitutes a cash outflow. To calculate how much this cash outflow will be, all I'm saying is, let's take the currently outstanding level of a given type of a retail deposit and let's multiply that currently outstanding level by the appropriate runoff rate. For example, for very stable retail deposits, which are backed by deposit insurance, the runoff rate is 3%. That means your cash outflow will be 3% times your current outstanding level of retail deposits, which are stable and backed by deposit insurance. The runoff rate for stable deposits not backed by deposit insurance is slightly higher, it's 5%. The runoff rate for less stable retail deposits is 10%. The runoff rate for corporate deposits, which comes under this category, would be higher, 40%. The runoff rate for this guy, the debt which is issued by SPVs and SIVs, will be 100%. Okay, this is how you would arrive at your expected cash outflows. For your expected cash inflows, all you have to do is you have to run through all your contractual receivables during the upcoming 30 days and multiply each of these receivables by an appropriate flow-in rate. Again, rates which are specified by the supervisor. Okay, This is how you calculate your LCR. Now, before I stop, let me do this. Let me quickly talk about the compliance with respect to LCR. The value of the LCR has to be calculated and reported on a periodic basis, at least monthly. The frequency of reporting the LCR goes up during stressed times. I've already said this, that banks, they need to maintain this LCR at a level which is greater than or equal to 100%. If the LCR at any point in time dips below this minimum level, that means falls below 100%, then this will invite a response from the supervisor. The nature of this response depends on, number one, the reasons as to why this dip in the LCR happened. Was it because of institution-specific reasons or was it because of a general system-wide stress to liquidity? Okay. Then the response depends on the type of entity we are looking at, its overall health, and it also depends on the duration and the frequency of the LCR dipping below this minimum specified level. Okay, This video was a quick look at this important ratio, which is the liquidity coverage ratio. We've taken a look at its calculation-related specifics and also We've looked at what all it takes to comply with the LCR. Okay?